This is the Crappie Connection brought to you by Redneck Rubber, Power Crappie, Visit Ridgeland, b and Poles, K-9 Fishing, Cornfield Fishing Gear, Bobby Garland Baits, Jenko Fishing, Denali Rods, the Direction TV, Top Hat Jigs, Crappie Magnet, Anderson Meadow Farm, Hook and Bullet Purpose Built Optics. What's up guys, Brad Chapel here. Got my bud at the end there. Todd Uckaby. We still here at the Grove, Oklahoma Tackle Show. Boy, it's been crowded, hasn't it? Oh, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean it's for for being still during the COVID scare and everything, this is a great crowd. Yeah, I mean people out there and it looks like uh, everybody's ready to go fishing and getting set up for it right now. So mm, absolutely. Set your plans for next year to come on out and Man, they've got some good buys, and man, everything you can imagine, whether it's catfishing, crappie fishing, popcorn, dogs, pop, <laughs> dogs, wrapping boats, <laughs> yeah. selling boats. Oh, uh, yeah. They've got a little bit of everything going on here, but uh, this episode, you know, I, I think of fine tuning a live scope, and this dude right here kind of comes to my mind, and he's kind of a he's, a, he's a wild cannon, I guess, a wild gun, or, or young gun, even. He's uh, Jeff Larch. Go ahead and do a little introduction to yourself there. Well, guys, uh, Jeff Larch, uh, full-time crappie guide out of Arkansas, uh, current 2021 world champion, and uh, live scope's the game, and that's something I adapted to and would like to think I do pretty good at it, so hopefully we can get to the bottom of a couple questions y'all have on uh, settings and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, you know, I know right when I got the live scope and you throw it on the boat, and first thing you think is, oh, my God, this thing's amazing. And then you think – well, how in the world can I get these fish to bite? How can I see them better? How can I utilize this equipment better? But, you know, let's let's take it real far back, and I will go to some advanced stuff with you, but tell us some of the basics about live scope and how to utilize it in your mind. You know, I mean, first, first and foremost, people don't realize that it can be utilized in multiple different ways. I mean, we have different modes that we can use it in and everything else, but just applications alone, um, I tell a lot of people that, hey, you know, you can just go to the lake, pull up in an area and shine this thing around. And if you see fish, you know, you're in the right area. If you don't see fish, obviously you probably need to move. And I mean, that's just step number one of how to use live scope. And then you can get into video game fishing is what we quote unquote call it. And, uh, uh, then you get into the perspective modes and, and other things of that nature. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of little tricks and tips and stuff like that that'll get you a far away. But basics, I mean, it's almost plug and play to go out and see fish with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, first time I threw it out and I made a video at that point and sent it to all my buddies. I was like, man, I don't care what you got to do. I don't know what you got to sell, but you need to be selling something and buying one of these things. Because, I mean, there's that, the, uh, so much advancement over the years with live scope is just mind-blowing and you guys are utilizing it and winning tournaments yeah absolutely and of course we know more about fish behavior now than we've ever knew before because now we can actually see it so a lot of the myths that were you know we thought were were solid truths back in the day we know are myths now and we we've learned that we've put that nail in the coffin lid and we're finding out new things every single day which basically makes you a better angler the entire time you're learning about the the core you're chasing you're only going to get better to chase what you're after yeah no doubt i mean uh, Todd, how's it kind of changed your your life when it comes to crappie fishing? Any or if a lot or? Oh yeah, I mean it's it's changed it tremendously. I I don't think it's a hundred percent for the better. Yeah. I, I and I'm starting to see as are all guides nationwide. We got some clients that are fed up with 
they they, they want to go old school fishing, which you're still doing. Yeah. You know, you you never you you use it as a tool. Yeah. You never use it as a crutch. Right. Um, you know, you used it for casting to brush piles yeah. to make sure that your jig was in the strike zone. But it, it all goes back to now it is a one fish at a time mm-hmm. as opposed to you pulling jigs. Yep. You're you've got the option of catching eight at a time. Yeah. Those numbers add up a lot quicker. Still spider rigging. You know, Jeff talks about his party barge fishing and pulling crankbaits, you know. You're you can still catch more fish fishing traditionally than you can with live scope, but if you're chasing bigger fish or if you're in a tournament setting where you only need seven or eight bites a day then that's where it comes into play as more of a crutch than a tool yeah i mean you know, i think you can utilize really live scope with way more techniques than people are are doing them with i mean i know everybody's chasing out open water fish and picking out you know the the big giants and that's how you win tournaments. Jeff can t- testify to that for sure. But, uh, you know, way I'm utilizing is sitting back off brush piles and casting to them. And, and people can do the same way with corks and shooting docks and spider rigging. I mean, spider rigging, uh, it's, it's a big advantage even to spider rig with because you can see exactly how far your baits are in the water. You, you can see. see if fish are coming up and not. That's right. Not eating. You know to adjust your speed or things like that. Yep. I spider rig yep. with clients a lot, and uh, the thing that helps me out with that, with the, the live scope on spider rigging, the same thing. I mean, I know I'm in an area that has fish or doesn't. I mean, I run both perspective and forward view. The perspective for the spider rigger is is amazing. I can see structure at a distance and know I need to push over that. I can see schools of fish that are moving. I can tell if they're moving away from my boat because I have my trolling motor too hot or anything like that so it's helping me out constantly but yet again i'm not using it as a crutch i'm using it as a tool to be able to improve what i'm already doing and like todd said i have a lot of clients that struggle to come out and understand how this technology works and you're trying to give them a crash course last minute i can go out and i can put my spider rig poles out pull crankbaits long line float and fly but i can still use my scope to my advantage to be able to say yeah i'm definitely in the area i need to be in and not waste time on the water by fishing areas that are low productivity you know i mean we're not gonna catch a lot of fish there let's move so for for a beginner for somebody who's just getting into this game what settings do you think that as soon as they plug it in first time how, how far out should they shoot So I generally leave mine on about 30 feet. Um, I will play with that a little bit, but 30 is a pretty good range. That's not a very long cast out away from you, but yet again, you can still get on fish at 30 feet in most water conditions, not spook them. So forward range, I try to keep around 30, maybe 40. Um, Gain, I'll run it pretty hot. I'm a little different than everybody else. Everybody wants to have that crystal clear picture. I kind of fall into the the idea of the more you clear that screen up, the less you're seeing in the water. And I want to see everything. I want to see every little limb. I want to see every little fish. And you know that that's just small stuff, but it makes a huge difference in the in the long run of things in a day. So I run my gain pretty hot, somewhere between sixty and seventy percent. Um, I run my color gain pretty hot. I run it around 80, 90%. And any time I can get away with it, my noise rejects and TVG, I run them completely off. I want that as raw as it can get personally. Yeah. You know, everybody says, oh, the ghost tree, the ghost tree. I catch more fish on the ghost tree than I do any piece of structure in the lake. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> some of the guys that I've talked to as well, and, and I was guilty of right when I got the. Uh, my live scope and everything i was wanting to adjust that forward range out and then i would bring it back in and then i'd want to adjust my depth but i've noticed the more that i can keep that consistent the faster i was able to really learn the size of fish and you know we're all going out there no matter what you're doing you know we want to catch at least eating size fish but if you start fooling with that bringing that screen in too close all of a sudden that six inch fish looks like a 12 inch fish you know i can move mine in uh tournament settings you know it, it, say i just happen to get out in a little deeper water and i increase that depth range just a little bit and it takes me 10 to 15 minutes to kind of realize really where the difference falls like you're saying that size changes completely so you know 
that's why I say I like to keep my forward range on pretty well, just a standard setting, so I don't have to worry about it because both forward range and depth range really affect the way that fish looks for size on that screen. So if you can get away with leaving it pretty set all the time, you'll start getting more accustomed to what you're seeing and both identifying what kind of fish you're throwing yeah. at too. Take it off auto. Yeah, take it off auto, absolutely. You want everything on manual settings. Yeah, I think that's one tip that it took me a little while to actually Well, to, to me, having it on auto is kind of like when we had 2D sonar and you had the fish symbols in there. Yeah. yeah. Because a, a fish symbol on a 2D sonar could be the end of a branch. Because if it couldn't connect it to something that went to the bottom, it's like, oh, it's a fish. Yeah. And so it's real comparable to that. What do you run yours on, Todd? Do you keep it at a certain distance out? or? Well, um for me personally on Eufaula, I'm at 20 feet, but you got to understand I can get right on top of fish on yeah. Eufaula. Our, our fish are not spooky. Yeah. They're, they're just not. I mean, you know, we've got a 16 foot rod out and mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have one on my boat because I don't have to have it on the lake that I fish on. I, I can put a 10 foot rod in your hand and I can drive you to that fish. So my fish aren't spooky. So 20 feet, but then. I guarantee you, like this weekend coming up, which this will air after this tournament, but Darbone, everybody keeps yeah. talking about Darbone, 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 Darbone. There's a tournament there every weekend, and there has been the last month, I think, or maybe five weeks, and they've got, still got like seven more weekends of straight tournaments. And those fish down there, sometimes you can't get within 50 feet of them. Right. And so if I was a tournament fisherman, I would be shooting out further. But for a client, for me, 20 feet. But there again, I'm fishing shallow, muddy water. I can creep up on them. See, I leave mine at 40, and I never change it. You know, and I mean, it's, it's really all just dictated to where you're fishing most of the time. Um, I fish yeah. shallow, muddy water a lot of the times back home. And, and just like Todd said, I mean, I can get those fish really close to the boat. I can get them within eight foot of the trolling motor, even when they're three foot deep. But there are a few times of the year, especially around holiday weekends and stuff like that, when the traffic increases, you know, that that's when you got to start kind of getting away from what you're comfortable with and start kind of pushing that limit. Um, there's Unfortunately, there is no just solid dead set way that yeah. I can tell you that go out and it just work all the time it's something you got to play well, with well it's just like all three of us todd's at 20 you're at 30 and i usually set it at 40 and don't mess with it yeah and i mean even our depth range so mm -hmm. once i get back from this show i'll be on eufaula i don't care if i'm in six foot or if i'm in 20 foot i'm probably gonna have my depth set at 12 foot the reason why is because if i'm out in i'm gonna be in the creek Everybody knows where I'll be. But even if I'm in 20 foot, there's not going to be a crappie below about 12 foot. So I'm not even going to look down there. Right. But by leaving it there, like we talked about, and being able to size those fish, if I do pull up into eight feet, even though my, my actual, what I'm looking at is not all the way to the bottom, only this big, clients can get that idea of, okay, we've already seen that, this is the size on here and so by not changing it for a client because the client's only got a few hours to take this up. crash course and so if i change anything at all on it it totally messes them up yeah do you keep yours at a set depth you know i'm kind of like todd i keep it at 12 a lot um, when i'm fishing open water and chasing roaming fish a lot of times I find that, you know, they may be at, say, 12, 15 foot and 20 foot of water. Well, there's no point in me running it all the way 20 foot down yeah. on the bottom when I know I'm only going to be targeting fish like that. So I do try to keep it as, as shallow as I possibly can for the most part to an extent. You don't want to get in three foot of water and crank that thing up on three foot. Yeah. You know, that everything is just huge. Blows shad, the shad blows by and you're like, man, that was an 80 pound crappie mm -hmm. just swam by there, you know, but that's just kind of the nature of how it works. But like he says, I, I would prefer to keep it at a solid place as much as possible. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I'll use Robert Carlisle for an example. I know Robert for the longest time kept his on 20 foot depth range, no matter what lake he was in and what depth of water he was in. And that was just like we it were saying, it worked for him. It keep size those fish up that way. So I'm a shallow water guy i keep mine around 12 about like todd does my forward range is a little different that's about size Mine's at 15 hmm? 15 for 15. depth yeah e even if you're in 30 foot of water yep yeah yeah and i you know kind of my thought process through the years on the lakes that i fish uh 
typically I don't have to catch them any deeper than 11 or 12. Winter time's a little bit different, but spring through the fall, I know in the Ross Barnett, you can just about put a $100 bill. They're going to be 11 to 12 foot deep. Mm. You know, in the mornings, they'll come up higher than that. And then as the sun gets up, they'll sink down to that 11 to 12. But uh, it seems to me, too, that most of the active fish are on that top side of the tree or whatever it is I'm looking at. But I try to keep it about 15 right. and leave it alone. And it's helped me size up fish. And everybody wants to learn how you do that. And that's one of the ways you do that is not messing with these two keys on that screen well one of my jokingly with people all the time people ask me they say how can you tell the difference between big fish and little fish and i say well for one if i throw a jig in there and that jig i can see it on the screen and the fish i'm fishing for doesn't look to be much bigger than that jig he's probably not much bigger than yeah. that jig but all serious seriousness it's it's simply if i see a fish that is bigger than the other fish i've been seeing he is obviously a bigger fish it's, it's something just as simple as that, but, you know, a lot of people do seem to struggle with that. Yeah. You know, sizing fish is, is kind of one of those things. But same time, if you're a tournament fisherman, it's a big deal. If you're just a regular, everyday fisherman that wants to go fill up the freezer, you know, not so much of a big deal. And I, I think over the last three and a half years or whatever, the number one thing I get with clients who are new to this forward-facing sonar is that they try to watch the whole screen yeah all day long when i'm if, if if i'm sweeping an area with the trolling motor sweeping 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 i'm only looking at the edge yeah like just the far right third or fourth because anything that is closer in i would have already seen and so it doesn't matter but then every once in a while they'll be like what was that and I'll be like, I don't, like what? Oh, there was something right under the trolling motor. I'm like, I don't know. I wasn't even looking there. So they're trying to process this much information instead of this much information. And they're, they're not keying on those details out that far. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, time on the water, that's phrase that's been out with fishing in general forever. And this piece of technology has really made that statement even more evident because if you think you can get out there and just automatically know what you're doing with a live scope and you might be a great fisherman but this piece of equipment you've got to have patience you got to have time on the water and i think that to me is one of the biggest keys to learning live scope is just that time on the water and you know fine-tuning what you want to do with it if you're like you said these guys are fishing shallower than i normally do well you know they've adjusted their screens to kind of dictate that deal yeah um you know back to what i was talking about i i cannot stress this enough look at the future not what's underneath you it's just like driving a boat or driving a truck i mean when you're driving down the highway you're not looking two feet in front of the truck you're looking way far out in front of the truck so you can see what's coming towards you so when you're going through there and you're scanning if you're looking at that whole screen you're trying to process way too much information and if they if they've done made their way underneath the trolling motor i'd say you can't stop turn around and go back and get to that fish anyway he's pretty well gone just forget him he's out of the picture so you know that's kind of the way i look at it well mm. Well, we'll leave that one for seed today yep so what about like colors i know that you know you've got so many different color applications uh from the amber to you know teal or what have you what are your preferences on that so i prefer the amber most of the time um now on overcast days i will do the black emerald and even the blue uh seems like sometimes that helps but for some reason if it's raining and i'm getting water on the screen the blue seems to help me better than anything for some reason it, it just stands out through the water droplets on the screen to me Amber's what I like, but you know everybody has their own little bit of tolerance of color blindness. So whatever you're seeing the best is going to work best for you. Me personally, it's amber 110% all the way. It just it shows up good. I can see the fins on the fish. I can tell where his head is, his tail is. And that's a huge part of live scope. If you're sitting there fishing for one's tail for 30 minutes, you're not going to get his attention and catch yeah. him. So, what's the best way to identify a crappie on your live scope? You know, we all three go through this one. But in your mind, when you're scanning around and all of a sudden you see that blip, how 
quick can you identify whether that's a white bass, large mouth, crappie, catfish? Well, I I can tell you real quick. So, Brad, you and I are pretty slow, and we kind of sit mm-hmm. in one spot, and this guy's all over the place. Right. He would be a sand bass. Or, right. <laughs> he's just over here, over yeah. here, over here, and me and you, you go by him, and you come back, and he's still in the same spot. That's crappie. Mm-hmm. I can I can pretty well tell just from the fin movement alone. Um, bass, white bass, sand bass, uh, even the yellow bass that we have down in the south a lot, even bluegill. They they constantly move around. They're always looking every direction around them. So there's a lot of fin movement you get out of those fish. Crappie do tend to just sit still a lot. Now there are times that they're moving across the water column and and that takes a little bit of skill to figure out. But the way a crappie's body flows compared to say a bass or a white bass is completely different. A white bass is a very stiff moving fish. So the movement of his body looks like his whole body shimmering like a crankbait as he goes across the screen to me. A crappie is more of just his tail moves while his body stays stiff. And then on a large mouth, they almost look like a tadpole rolling across that screen. And, and catfish look like sharks in an aquarium. So that's, and, just, that's just what I see. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, a, a crappie, will flutter and then glide yep and then it, as he starts to slow and almost come to a stop he'll flutter again and then glide and like what he was saying almost all other fish species are their bodies always moving they're, they're always on the mood they, they never just cruise they never just coast all right let's say we, we've got our live scopes out now and we see a fish we're dropping down on him what are you looking to do uh, as far as that fish behavior to actually catch them at that point what tells you that fish is ready to bite or he's not interested he's gonna move absolutely i mean i i, I stand by this 110 percent. even a fish that's not gonna bite it will recognize that you put a bait in the strike zone he's either gonna run from it he's gonna sink down he's gonna turn around and look at it turn away from it he's going to do something do not give up on a fish because you dropped on him four or five times and said, oh, he don't care. The odds say he has not seen it. I mean, yeah. you got to understand crappie have a very small strike zone. I mean, it's from the tip of their nose to about here above their eyes saying he's facing this way. Mm-hmm. If you don't get it in that little area, they generally have no clue it's there. I mean, you can fish this far behind one's dorsal fin for 30 minutes. He never has a clue it's there. But until he does something, I'm not leaving him alone. Yeah. It just seems like... If you can ever get that fish to do that, toot, that little, it's over. It, he if he starts moving that upward angle on that front side, so he can if, get the net. If if you drop a bait on one and you see one on the screen come up and his body is oriented, say completely horizontal. I mean, he's coming mm-hmm. up this way. The odds say that fish will short strike your bait or will not bite your bait at all. Like that is a curiosity approach. He's coming to see what it is, but he is not aggressively feeding coming towards it. And like you said. We call it sharking. When you drop it down and he cur- turns up like this right here, most of the time you almost can't get that bait fast enough away from that fish. That is the I'm going to eat you stance. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is no no different than an NFL player when he gets down in the hike position. He ain't doing that so he can stand there for 30 minutes. He's doing it because he's getting ready to hit the guy across from him. Yeah. I know what you see them that angle. I, I've seen clients do it in my boat. They want to freeze at that point. And I keep telling them, slowly lift it, keep keep moving it up, keep moving it up. And all of a sudden you'll feel the, he'll move like a strike of lightning and it's smoking. Mm-hmm. What's some other tips you can give us on live scope? On your opinion on how can you get better with this piece of equipment? I tell everybody, and seriously, seriously, when you put one on your boat before you ever turn it on, Go to a lake where you got a nice dock you can pull your boat up beside. Two things I like to do. The first thing I tell everybody is put your foot control trolling motor in the water. Learn how to parallel park your boat next to that dock with that trolling motor and stop it without hitting that dock. When you get to the point that you can control your boat that good with a foot control trolling motor, you're now ready to turn the screen on. Tie your boat up, turn your screen on, point your trolling motor somewhere, pick up a pole, throw a bait out in front of it. If you don't see it on the screen, Pull your jig out of the water, move it. Don't move your trolling motor. Teach yourself where you need to throw in front of that trolling motor to see your bait. Once you get sighted in with your boat and you have good boat control, you are now ready to go to the lake and learn how to catch a fish with it. These are some of the most major steps to live scope fishing, in my opinion. 
It's taking the time. It's almost like sighting a rifle. It is. You I know, mean, if you don't know where you're you're looking at on that water surface compared to that screen, you're gonna miss your target every time. So one thing I go for a lot of times is I'll I'll throw out and my bait hits the water and it looks like it's going down on fish and maybe I turn my scope a little bit or something and I say, oh, well, it looks like my bait was to the right of the fish. Well, when I pull my bait out of the water, I look at the rings I just made because I don't have a target out there. And I say, well, that's where I hit. Well, I was to the right of him. I'm just throw to the left of those rings. You know, it gives me some sort of physical target to look at and actually move my bait around to get it closer to that fish. That's one little tip I tell every client I got. Look for that target that I make on the water right mm-hmm. there. That's going to be where you need to put it. You know, it's just like <clears throat> I, I know that the three of us have heard this a million times. Can't see my bait. Can't see my bait. Where's my jig? Where's my jig? And I'll tell them, I'm showing you the fish. Put your jig where the fish is. Like, if you want me to just show you your jig, we'll drive around all day, and I'll just I'll just show you your jig all day. But the chances of a fish coming across mm-hmm. this plane is pretty rare. But So it goes back to what Jeff was saying as far as learn – where to put your bait and there's still a lot of people who have years into this that are not as good as what they could be i i, I get them in my boat he gets them in his boat you get them in your how boat. many how many guys do y'all see on the water two guys sitting on the front of the boat they both got rods stuck out in front of the boat and they're staring mm-hmm. at the screen and they never look up all day and you never see them lift their rod they drive in circles all day staring at the screen with their pole out like this and they go back to the boat ramp and they're like man we caught two how did y'all catch 60. Yeah. you know that's that's what we're talking about being proactive and moving and getting that bait where it needs to be you know, you know and I, I i think one thing that people really need to realize if they're going to be truly truly live scoping is is that when when you go hunting you don't have your rifle shouldered all day that goes back to what he just said people will pick up a 14 or a 16 foot rod and they're like dude if i fish with this all day my shoulders gonna be wore out and i'm like you don't fish with it all day you have it you have it leaned up against your shoulder until you yeah. see your target. your target then you shoulder it then you then you drop on him you, you you don't keep your jig in the water all day if you're fishing this style if you're fishing old school then yeah you're gonna be long lining or something mm-hmm. but you know and, and that's there's rods designed for that technique if that's the technique you're going to use, you need a shorter, lighter rod to do that. You know, I mean that these these big rods that we have in, in the Huckabee lineup now, that's what they're for. They're for you putting them in a rod holder or holding them beside you until you see that fish that you need to target. And if you got to reach way out there, that's the tool you need for that job. But if you're going to two pole stroll, is the way I refer to it, hang two poles out and hold them in your hand. You know, 10, 11 foot rods, what you're going to need for that. You know, so. That's, mm-hmm. that's the thing, is, is kind of tailoring what you're going to do with, with your tools that you have. And live scoping, long rods tend to be the, the preference unless you're on, say, like where you're at, casting at fish. And then, yeah. obviously, you know you're casting at them, so you don't need a long rod yeah. at that point. Six foot's plenty for me. <laughs> <laughs> unless I'm long lining, then I got 18. Whatever works. <laughs> that's it. Well, it's been fun, guys, as always. Hopefully, y'all picked up something on the, off this show, and I hope you learned a little something. and. You know, the, the only thing that I want to add to this is you talked about color palette. Mm-hmm. And Jeff said amber. That's what I run. But yet, if we had Jerry Hancock in here, he's the emerald blue guys. I'm that and, guy. Are you? Yeah. Okay. Well, that being said, we all three and a lot of the people in this building now are wearing the new purpose-built glasses the hook and bullet which are made for screen Mm -hmm. if you get to talking to these guys that understand more about your eyes and sunglasses than what we ever will they will explain to you that a lot of times which color palette is best for you has to do with your eyes and this what color lens you're wearing in your sunglasses so there's gonna be people out there and so when when you were talking about that sometimes when it it gets cloudy and you change colors, that may be because you're taking your sunglasses off when it gets dark. That absolutely could be it. I know one thing, I run my hook and bullets every day on the boat and they absolutely take the fatigue off my eyes of staring at that screen so I don't have that headache when I get in. But it makes them fish pop to me and it helps me a bunch. But but think about that. Next time it gets real dark and cloudy and you change colors, 
you probably went like this because it was getting dark and cloudy. Oh, yeah, more than likely did. I and didn't think Todd did. ever took off sunglasses. Every once in a while, I want to sleep. He, That's what I figured. He does have eyes, I promise. <laughs> hey, if Jimmy Houston get away with it for 45 <laughs> years. Hank Jr. Yeah, there you go. He wears sunglasses everywhere. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you all. All right, buddy. Till next time. Todd Huckabee. Jeff Larch. Brad Chapel. Holla. Big muddy river, a place I'll always remember. A cabin on the lake and a fishing pole. Forever here, I'll rest my soul. I can feel my worries drift away.